Okay, Chair, we're live now. Right. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this virtual meeting of the Planning and Development Committee. Can I remind all participants that normal rules of procedure apply? For example, comments and questions need to be directed through the Chair. As we are meeting virtually, proceedings may, may take slightly longer, so your patience is appreciated. As per our virtual meeting procedures, if questions have been received prior to the meeting, I will call on the relevant member at the appropriate time to raise that question. If you are invited to speak, please state your name and be as specific as possible about which issue it is you are speaking to. Whilst members of the public can review this meeting on YouTube Live, they will not be able to actively participate or comment on proceedings. As this meeting is being live streamed, can I remind all participants that their conduct should reflect this. Any agents or objectors that wish to speak on a particular application have had the opportunity to inform planning department in advance of today's meeting. I will invite those individuals to present their cases at the appropriate time in proceedings. Withholding the, the meeting remotely to reduce the likelihood of technical issues, these individuals have been asked to dial into the meeting via telephone. Please be advised there will be a time limit of five minutes for those who wish to speak in support of an application and five minutes for those who wish to speak an objection. For example, if more than one person wishes to speak an objection to an application, the time allocated of five minutes will be divided by those speakers. There may be also award councillors in attendance who wish to speak. I'm the chair of the committee today. My name is Councillor John Hobson. I represent Martin West Ward. Also in attendance are Paul Clark and Andy Grossop from, from Planning, Simon Thompson from Highways, Emma Loughran from Legal, Georgina Moore and Chris Lund from Democratic Services. I'm not sure it is Dan with us today. Yes, he is, Chair. Right, and Dan Johnson as well. The other individuals you can see in attendance are councillors who are members of this committee. They will make the decisions on the applications scheduled for today's meeting. All right, with no more ado, we'll start. Agenda item two, apologies for absence. Um, apologies have been received from Councillor Thompson and Councillor Dean is substituting on her behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Do we have any declarations of interest from members of the committee in respect of the items scheduled for consideration at today's meeting? Chair, could, could I just interrupt um, before any declarations are made? Um, if I could just remind members about declarations of interest in their role in the committee. Um, they're acting as independent members of the committee without preconceived ideas of the decisions to be made. And they must make their decisions based on planning considerations and therefore if any member does feel that they're biased at all towards a particular decision they should declare it at this point it would not necessarily prevent them from being involved in any discussions but it may prevent them from voting thank you thank you emma right declarations of interest councillor dean councillor platt anybody else no. Chair, can we just confirm which items those relate to? Yes, which item is it? Is it item one or is it item two? Is it is it the item for the for the uh, the school for the um, the school or is it the other one? St David's School is in my ward. Right. ward. Sheila, what is yours? You're on mute, Sheila. Hi, right, Sheila. We didn't hear you. Can you say? Thank you, Chair. Item Agenda 2. I'm the Ward Councillor. Right. OK. And just to confirm, Chair, that those are non-pecuniary interests. Is right. that right, Councillor? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Fine. OK. Item Agenda 4. Minutes of the previous meeting. Can we approve the minutes as a correct record? Nobody approved, see. Chair. Approved, Chair. Nobody's saying no, so we'll agree them. Right, item agenda five, schedule of the planning applications considered by committee. Uh, we'll do them as they are on the report. We'll do um, the former St. David's School at Ackland first, 
followed by the second application, which is which is Kaywood Drive and Revo Drive at Tolsby. So we'll start off with the former St. David's School at Acklam. Before I hand over to Andy to share his screen with us, can I ask that all committee members refrain from asking questions until he's finished his presentation? So Andy, over to you. Could you please present the details of this application for the former St. David's School at Acklam? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll just share the screen now. Can members see that now? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So, um, the application is for the demolition of the existing caretakers' flat on the site at the former St David's School and the redevelopment of the school site for the erection of 139 dwellings. The site, members will be aware, is located off uh, Hall Drive. It's to the west of the Outward Academy, uh, to the east of properties on Ackland Road, and the site's essentially, essentially a triangle with houses in the associated back gardens onto two sides, and the other side is formed by the Avenue of Trees, which is the, the tree line pathway which leads up to Acklam Hall. The site is an allocated housing site. It's policy H34, which has established the principle for residential development on this site. It's also part of a brown, well, it's part brownfield site. It's within the urban area of Middlesbrough and it's within the limits of development, which is defined by the local plan. So the key considerations for this proposal really are the policy criteria and then any other material planning considerations so the policy allocates the site, we'll see this from the, the text in the policy there, it allocates the site for high quality, high value scheme to provide a maximum of 115 dwellings. Um, although policy H1, which is the spatial strategy policy for, for all the housing policies in the local plan, advises that this maximum number can be exceeded where it can be clearly demonstrated through a design that approach um, that well, basically the, the characteristics of the surrounding area uh, can be improved, if you like, by as a result of this, uh, the design of the scheme. I think what I sh should mention, Chair, as well, para 24 of the report, uh, quick apologies, there's a typo, a typing error within that. Um, it wrongly states that the maximum is 155. It's not, the policy maximum says 115 in that specific policy, but the rest of the document does refer to 115 throughout. So hopefully that's not caused any specific confusion. I'll just quickly run through, before I get into the details of whether or not it complies with policy, I'll just run through each of those criteria within the policy, just so members can be aware of them. So it's expected, the development proposals on the site are expected to provide a development that reflects housing types in the surrounding area, and it recognises them as predominantly three and four beds with semi and detached. Something that responds positively to the Acklam Hall conservation area, and the historic avenue of trees, something uh, that should front onto the avenue of trees, no vehicular access onto the avenue of trees, it should utilise the existing access from St David's Way, it should maintain and enhance the pedestrian footpath between Ackland Road and Hall Drive, should ensure um, that the design proposal takes account of any surface water flooding issues, should retain existing mature trees on the site, 15% affordable housing, five on site, 10% off, should provide off-site improvements for schools and at the bottom there development will not be permitted until the reprovision of the playing pitches currently on the site is made elsewhere in the town and so these are the starting points for considerations you know effectively the question is does it comply with these and then how is it considered against the other material planning considerations so looking at this this is a proposed layout plan uh, and I'll, I'll zoom into some of these areas to get into a bit more detail, but the predominance is two, uh, sorry, three and four beds, which is policy compliant. And there is a mix of semi-detached and detached properties. There's also five, three bed bungalows within the site proposal. And based on this, it's argued that it's compliant with that first criteria of the policy. The eastern section so we can see here the, the the dark green section all down this line that's outside the site that's the historic avenue of trees 
And then we've got this thin green um, section next to it. That's a mature hedgerow that runs down the edge of the site and it buffers the um, avenue of trees from the site effectively. Um, the scheme has been designed to respect the avenue of trees and it's been set away with a landscaped open strip between the houses and the private drives. So we can just see that running all the way along here. And all these properties down this eastern edge all front onto the avenue of trees. So again, um, all that's compliant with the second and third policy criteria. And all that um, planting is indicated as putting in some native spe species trees, bulbs, meadow grass, and, and maintain maintenance of that and supplementation of the existing hedgerow that's there. The proposed scheme seeks to utilise um, St David's Way as the only, or, yeah, St David's Way. It's the only vehicular access into the site, and that's required by the fourth criteria of the policy. The scheme seeks to enhance it, looks to support it. The scheme looks to support the proposal with a realigned junction footpath uh, along the side of St David's Way, and uh, which then runs out onto Ackland Road, as well as some small areas of on-street parking. Those aspects will are considered to meet the fourth and fifth criteria of the policy. Simon Thompson will come in chair to cover some of the highway matters in more detail after I've, I've finished, if that's all right. Uh, so turning to the next element, drainage. Drainage for the sites, it's been assessed and a scheme has been proposed to deal with surface water. Um, which it all arises from this development and it's in a manner which will not increase any risk of flooding elsewhere. The site assessment, the ground conditions, has confirmed that water doesn't easily permeate the ground and so a soak away has not been possible to design for this for this site um, where rainwater would normally collect and then percolate uh, through the groundwater. Um, it's also got a high water table and so a suds pond would be particularly difficult to construct and so what the applicant's done instead is opted for uh, you can see this from this slide what's basically an underground tank which is a collection pond if you like and that then is covered over and that is all sort of public open space above that so that's none of that's actually seen we can see the blue drainage lines they feed the drainage from the site the surface water into this collection tank um, that's been designed on a hundred year to deal with if you like what we call a hundred year um, calculations, which allows for climate change as well in future years. And what happens then is it then discharges into this pumping station, which is again, the main parts of that are underground. And then from the pumping space station, there's new pipe work fed all the way up St. David's way out onto Hall Drive and along Hall Drive. Northumbrian Water have said there's capacity within the drainage system subject to them connecting into manhole 9803 which is on hall drive and that's exactly what this scheme proposes to do and northumbrian water as they do with all housing schemes they set the if you like the discharge rate that's allowed from this site so that pumping station will be restricted to pumping out at a rate of 19 liters a second and that the whole purpose of that attenuation tank is to retain the water and allow it to go out at, at that rate um just to touch on foul water drainage from the site this is again piped into a what's called a wet well it's part of parcel of the, the pumping station area and then that is then pumped out again into a new rising main which connects into cowley road and that again is limited and connected uh, as per northumbrian water requirements so 9.2 liters a second and it's connected where northumbrian water have made that request um Criteria seven, so sorry, so that in, in that sense, it's it's considered to accord, accord with criteria six of policy H34. Looking at criteria seven, this talks about the retention of mature trees on the site. Um, and what we've got here is the main hedgerow down the eastern boundary, that's all been maintained. We've got hedgerow groups along the sort of southwestern boundary, the route through from Ackland Road where there's some mature trees and then other trees dotted around. Not all these trees are within the site, some are adjacent, but the majority of what's shown is within the site. All the dark green uh, circles are retained trees. Uh, there's two main ones within the site really, which is up in the northern area, and we'll see that from the photographs. Um, 
the applicants undertake an arboral cultural report to assess the, the condition of each tree. There's some tree management works that are required. What we can see from these images, so this is a hedgerow that I'm talking about that's going to be maintained next to the avenue of trees, and that'll help to basically separate the two uses. It'll help the avenue of trees to be to, to be sort of semi-natural, if you like, and, and a sort of quiet space, and it'll allow the housing development to look onto this uh, onto this hedgerow and for it to add to the quality of the, the housing area. Um, the, the, these are some of the retained trees within the site and then along the boundaries of the site. You can feel from the images that the site's largely uh, not really got any, any trees of merit. And this is the route through from Ackland Road, which has got quite a few mature trees in, and it's really intended to, to maintain those in pretty much in the current form. And the pathway and cycleway would connect up through that through that area. Um, so again, um, all these aspects are really going to supplement what's there at the moment. There's new landscaping going in and it should create a landscape setting for the public realm and the street scene and the proposal is really considered to accord with the seventh criteria therefore of, of policy h34 we have a policy part, criteria within the policy which requires 15 percent affordable housing to be provided uh, which totals 21 units it was initially proposed that the five percent on-site provision would be houses but there's been a request for some bungalows to be provided within the site um, and from an officer perspective we know you know that bungalows take up more land than houses do and uh, officers feel it's appropriate to accept that the provision of five bungalows within the site is um, reasonably meeting the on-site requirement for affordable housing and that the remaining affordable housing can be met through section 106 agreement which would be in part uh, with the applicant but also there'd be a need because it's a count, partly council-owned site, there'd be need for some of that to be uh, achieved from the council's capital receipt. Um, and in view of those matters, again, considered that this proposal will be able to meet those policy requirements. The penultimate criteria of policy H34 advises that off-site improvements to school should school provision should be made. Following consultation with the council's education team, though, it's been indicated that there's no requirement for education contribution from this proposed scheme. And that takes into account the school capacities when this scheme um, will be effectively occupied in future years. So officers consider that to be addressed. And the final criteria is the reprovision of the sports sports pitches. We know that um, we uh, we need to re-provide sports pitches or retain existing levels of sports pitches. Sport England have been a consultee to this application and they have agreed with what the policy requires, i.e. replacement of pitches. The um, a, a scheme has been designed for these to go on the existing playing fields that the council on, on land that the council owns. It's over at the Outward Academy. So the site's in red and the pitches are intended to be provided where the yellow circle is. Um, this would see the provision of three pitches that be laid out and brought up to a playable standard and that's part of Sport England's requirements. The pitches would have general public access and would be served by the existing footpath network in the area. Earthworks, drainage and, and what's called sort of soil management to get the soil condition right would all be part of the works which would be undertaken to, to, to this area to achieve what's necessary and again the schemes demonstrating that it, that it can be compliant with this policy criteria and that would be dealt with by condition and section 106 agreement. So it's the officer's view that the proposed development does comply with all these policy criteria and so the considerations then turn to the number of houses that have been proposed. Obviously um, I don't want to particularly go over all the details covered within the report chair but I'd just like to discuss design quality because um, in view of what the policy says um, and then I'll obviously pass on to, to Simon to talk about some highway matters. I'd also like to point out there's been 99 neighbour letters that were sent out in the local area. A press notice was put uh, in the paper and site notices were put up to advertise the application and invite comment as we would normally do. We received 30 objections, uh, two support comments and two general comments and they're within reports. Um, so as mentioned, so policy H34 advises 115 is the max. 
but policy H1 says maximums can be exceeded where it can be demonstrated through a design-led approach that um, more can be more suitable. So looking at the slides again, um, St David's Way has been improved. What they're looking at doing through this proposal is providing an off-site, sorry, an off-carriageway footway through the site. So we can see this white line with the yellow dots. That would provide a footway and cycleway which links up all the way through the site and out onto Acklam Road. And that comes out just at a point where there's a, I believe there's a pedestrian crossing. Um, and that would really give a, a very positive aspect for future residents of the scheme, but also existing residents in the area. It would provide a pleasant route, a safe and inviting route for pedestrians and for cyclists. Coming into the site proper from St David's Way, so on entering the site, the properties are all set back here, fronting the avenue of trees, which we've mentioned. We've got landscaping to the front. We've got landscaping on this northern corner. So it's a very, um, well, it creates a landscape vista, um, creates a very positive area. Existing and new trees kind of define the corridor through the site. You can see additional trees getting planted up to continue this sort of corridor through the site. Um, and landscaping really is going to sort of dominate this this area. On the northern side of the site, um, we're seeing a footpath effectively only on one side of a lot of the roads within this development, and that helps to reduce the amount of sort of engineering and hard surfacing and, for want of a better term, tarmac within the development and, and adds greenery within the development. So that allows... Um, things like hedge planting along the edge of the road, mounding around the public open space, and then tree planting within some key areas to just separate people from the footpaths, between the footpaths and, and the highway. Um, it's felt that this is, you know, very positive, high quality uh, area that will be achieved by this. And I think it's worth pointing out as well that all the open space areas um, will be overlooked by the properties, um, which again, helps to significantly improve the, the way in which they can be used or should be used and reduce potential for sort of, well, designing out antisocial behaviour, designing out crime. This is a, a street scene view coming into the site. It's quite zoomed in, but um, you get the feel for the retention of the existing landscape and additional landscaping and the sort of quality of housing types that's been proposed as part of the scheme. Also, within this northern area, the applicant's proposing what what's called a trim trail. So these purple dots are intended to be sort of several pieces of equipment to be installed, which will basically allow active play or sort of exercise to be achieved within the site, but done in a more informal way than maybe in the past where, you know, there'd be a normal sort of play, little play park or something like that, which historically have sometimes created problems for people who live next door to them and things like this. These are sort of spread out within that area uh, and very much informal and arguably add to the character of what the applicant's been trying to create for the development, I think. Um, slightly further into the site, but maintaining that key footpath and cycle route through, this this runs through a landscaped communal area and all these properties are then fronting onto this area. So that's considered will be a very positive um, aspect. That runs all the way through to Acklam Road. And we've got a sort of computer generated image of what that should look like. You can get a feel for the, 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 the separation between the houses and the communal space by the hedges and the railings by effectively semi-natural sort of interventions, which is quite positive to the overall character. Um, lower part of the site, very, very similar, really. We've got a single sided footway, a footway on one side of the road. We've got front gardens, back gardens. And then we've got this, again, the avenue of trees, which is buffered by a landscape. And we've got additional new planting coming in, creating sort of focal points for a lot of the houses, which are fronting out onto some of those some of those areas. Um, the, I'll just talk through the house types as well, if I may. So... These are some of the house types that have been proposed. I understand it's Avance, um, the applicant's village uh, design. So we've got a lot of features within these, um, porches, cantilever porches, uh, different materials. We've got sort of feature brickwork and other bits of details, timber work, et cetera, within some of these design aspects on the fronts of properties. 
And I think members will get the feel that obviously looking at some of those, that, that's kind of the, the ultimate feel. I think the elevations are a little bit difficult to read. We've got things like the projecting bay windows, et cetera, which all help to add a consistent character through the, through the development. Um, I would like to touch on sustainability as, as well, Chair, that this slide shows the site in relation to the services and the provisions around it, which will support sustainable living, which is obviously at the heart of sort of national and local planning policy guidance. We can see that the site is in close proximity to bus services on Hall Drive. So the site's hatched there. We've got the Hall Drive bus stops and we've got bus stops along Ackland Road. Um, there are primary schools within um, within what's essentially a, a walking distance. Same with secondary schools. Um, there's shops within walking distance, outdoor amenity and leisure associated with the Avenue of Trees, Ackland Hall and, and sort of land beyond. And obviously with a proposed pitch provision nearby, that'll further add support to residents really having very strong and clear alternatives to um, accessing these uh, provisions without having to get into the car so really being able to live in a way which doesn't particularly add traffic or you know onto the the network for a lot of these sort of movements and travel um, the applicant has amended the scheme on numerous occasions and has consistently refined the details to get to this position um, there are no undue impacts on privacy and amenity of residents from officers' perspective. Um, the proposals will give a new use to the site. It'll allow residential curtilages, residential curtilage, curtilages to back onto the existing property. So that means sort of back garden to back garden. And that'll arguably take away some of the, possibly a degree of security issue around it being an unused site. Officers' view is that the proposed development is going to be high quality. The house types include numerous detail features, which will add to the visual quality. Um, it's considered that the proposals do meet the policy allowance in relation to the numbers of the site, given these sort of design, given these design aspects. Um, before I pass on to Simon to deal with the highways matters, Chair, we've received comments from the North East Chamber of Commerce. We've only come in the last two days. So it's been too late to provide committee with an update report, but I will just um, read that out if I may chair. Um, so what it says is representing the North East Chamber of Commerce, we would like to support this application in principle as it represents a key opportunity for regeneration in the area and utilizes a brownfield site rather than a greenfield site. The project will provide employment and new housing stock and will act as an exemplar for what can be achieved with such sites. Officers have recommended the passing of the application and it meets current planning guidance. Refusal of this application may serve to hamper future investment in, in Middlesbrough as future developers and investors may view planning as a costly process. As the economy may struggle in the coming months due to continuing economic pressures, a site such as this and any future investments by other companies will be vital to the local economy. The developer has a strong reputation and is willing to work with the local community and utilise suppliers in the local area in delivering the homes on the site. That's it from me, Chair. Very wordy, so apologies, but I'll pass on to Simon to pick up on highway aspects, if I may. Chair, you're on mute. Yep. Uh... Sorry, oh, yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Simon, can you come in, please? <laughs> yep, sorry, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Right, so um, I think it was it was going to be useful, um, given some of the comments we've had from, from members recently on a number of schemes, I thought it'd be useful to perhaps take a bit of a step back and just explain the, the strategic model that we use. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but hopefully it will explain uh, how we get to the outcome that we're discussing today in this recommendation. So, you know, very briefly, the, the model is evidence-based and it, it's built in stages. Um, the input data into that model includes traffic count data, journey time data from, from GPS, from vehicles, bus routing, bus stops, traffic signal timings, and then um, CAD and survey data, you know, your road widths and that sort of detail. 
once that model has been built in the program, we then validate it. Uh, and that means that we check the journey times against the input journey time data. So that makes sure that the model is valid and representative of what is actually seen on the ground. Um, the model is built in accordance with national guidance. It's been validated. And then there's a further check. We had it independently audited by a third party set of uh, consultants that weren't involved in constructing the model. So as you can see, hopefully you can see that robustness is built into every layer. As a highway authority, we want to make sure that it's, it's representative. And this approach allows us to forecast future years and assess the whole of our network accurately. Now, what what is the alternative? I suppose traditionally uh, you would have had individual junction assessment. Now, what those individual sort of old school approaches can do is assess junctions in isolation, but what they're not very good at is assessing how junctions interact with each other or complicated bits of network and you get a very localized approach. So as you can see from the screen there, um, the site we were considering we have a number of junctions on top of each other. And of those junctions, we've got a mixture. We've got some priority T junctions. We've got some with right turn, some without right turn, some signalized junctions. We've then got pedestrian cycle crossing facilities. So uh, what the model allows us to do is understand how development traffic and general traffic interacts at all these junctions and say for instance you get a bit of delay at one junction it's what will the impact of that be on the next adjacent junctions so we get much more of a an holistic approach and that allows us to consider the local area but also the impact of development across a, a greater area and and often the whole of Middlesbrough um, because we're then building the model, um, we can then add in future year scenarios. So we make um, assumptions based on national data as to future traffic growth, and we can start loading in other development sites that are committed and highway improvement schemes. So we're getting the most accurate representation of what the future year scenario would look like. So then we get the traffic generation of this um, this specific scheme. So as I've said, everything is evidence based. And in terms of traffic generation, what we what we do is we have um, surveys of other residential schemes. So you know, uh, residential development has been built or partially completed, and then the vehicle movements during the peak periods. Uh, accounted and we get trip rates. So it's evidence based. Um, once we've got the access and the traffic generation, we can then load into the model. And that's what we've done here. So this development based on that evidence based um, survey approach is likely to generate in the region of 100 to 110 two way vehicle trips over the AM and PM peak periods. What we've shown there is the development trips in the light blue against the future year traffic flows. So if that development didn't go ahead, there would still be, for instance, uh, the Hall Drive and Ackland Road Junction, 2,500 vehicles during the peak periods. So as you can see from this, the proportion of development traffic from these proposals is a very small proportion of overall traffic flowing through that junction. And, and, and that's how we get to the position where we can say comfortably that this scheme will not have a material impact in terms of the operation of the uh, network. The, as you can see there, um, as you get further away from the, the site, the impact of development traffic starts to reduce further as vehicles start taking different junctions, different turns and spreading across the, the network. So again, that, that impact gets proportionately smaller. I, I, th I think another point that's worth making is, it to, is that we're, we're not saying that development will not um, 
generate additional traffic to the network. What we're bound to consider is what the impact of that additional traffic is and then assess it against um, the MPPF. Um, we, we've got to talk about whether it's a material impact, whether it's a severe impact, and whether that impact can be mitigated against. So we believe that this scheme will not have a material impact. Um, the model demonstrates that. The model has looked at the impact of development on a number of levels. It's looked at it across the whole of the network, i.e. the whole of Middlesbrough. It's looked on journey time routes, so say the Acklam Road corridor as a journey time route, and then it's also considered the individual junction assessment. Again, what I'd add is that these traffic flows uh, are based on traffic survey data that was built into the model before COVID. So this is how the network and how many uh, networks across the country used to operate before COVID. We have not seen traffic levels go back to pre-COVID levels yet. So there's that, addition, and there's that additional level of robustness. We also test the network, and this impact that we're seeing here is the peak period. So that is when the development is generating the most amount of traffic, when the network has its highest level of traffic on it, and therefore it's it's more sensitive. Outside of that AM and PM peak, the network will have significant capacity and will flow much more freely. So we've always got to consider whether it's appropriate uh, to undertake a lot of mitigation geared up towards traffic for effectively what could be 15 to 30 minutes in the uh, AM and PM periods. We've then also looked at another issue that's been raised in terms of safety. And, and what we're bound to consider is we look at accident records for the immediate highway network. And what we're looking for is if there are any um, patterns of accidents, if there's a high level of accidents, if it involves certain types of highway users. And we need to assess whether the development proposals will exacerbate any accident patterns so we can clearly say whether a development would make a certain type of accident or a certain type of accident involving a highway user more likely. When we've looked at that, there is no pattern. It hasn't got a particularly high amount of accidents in the area and therefore the development um, will, not, will not exacerbate any issues. We then have moved on and we've looked at the access St. David's Way obviously already exists, um, the junction there with, with Hall Drive. Um, the sight lines at that junction are in accordance with the necessary standards and guidance. Um, we've got slight curb works uh, to realign the curbs and provide a traditional junction, as you would see with any other side road to a residential area. Tactile paving drop curbs for pedestrians uh, running along. The plateau table that's currently at that junction will be removed as part of these works. Uh, the area will be resurfaced and then we're putting in the, the two, or it's proposed to put in two pairs of speed cushions instead. So that will continue to reinforce that traffic calming um, scheme across Hall Drive and restrain vehicle speeds. St. David's Way is going to be reconstructed to adoptable standards and offered for adoption as public highway. So we'll have improved highway drainage, street lighting. And as Andy's mentioned previously, we've got the shared pedestrian cycle route on, on the east side there. As part of that, we've got some managed areas of on-street parking, which are being created. And the parking levels within the development meet the Tees Valley design guidance. So this on-street parking is actually more a benefit um, to the wider community, those using adjacent sports pitches or visiting the Avenue of Trees. It will also um, act as a traffic calming feature to keep vehicle speeds low. I think I'll just add on from Andy's comment in terms of the use of materials and the landscaping. Extensive work has been undertaken in this design and will be continued uh, with the developers and their consultant engineers to look at the standards of construction to minimise as much as possible any potential harm to the trees. 
um, and the materials that are being proposed are quite high quality. We're looking at flagged paving, block paving, and trying to minimise the amount of tarmac to, as Andy said, to create a high quality development. In terms of then turning on to sustainability, um, I think there's always, you know, for, for valid reasons, traffic is a um, very contentious issue and is often at the, the forefront of, of people's minds. But we do need to be careful that we don't put too much emphasis on cars, uh, vehicular capacity and traffic at the expense of promoting sustainable travel and um, providing facilities and options for those people that um, don't own vehicles or choose not to travel by car. So generally, for journeys on foot, the, the gold standard is four or eight hundred metres, and that's a five or a ten minute walk. Now, what you'll see on, on there is those green lines, uh, actual um, walking routes, and we've done the distance there on walking routes. So it's not as the crow flies, it's how long it will actually take you to get somewhere. Bus stops are literally within a two or three minute walk. Those buses Bus stops are served by um, very frequent services that connect into other parts of town. You've got the health facilities, education, shops. So the it is entirely reasonable to expect that people that live on this development and in the wider area will be able to walk or cycle to do day-to-day um, -to -day, uh, functions. The infrastructure within this site as well we also need to be very careful that what we don't do is we don't try to provide footways for instance within a site so what we're always doing is looking at how these schemes connect into other schemes and as you as you can see you've got the connection from Acklam Road which will lead right the way through the center of the site and connect up on the Hall Drive so it's not only making the site sustainable for residents but it's also opening up uh, other routes for existing residents. If you live um, on the west side of Acklam Road um, and your child attends school, for instance, they've got a signalised crossing and then a traffic-free route straight through uh, to schools there. Um, I think that's that's really all I wanted to, to add in, in terms of highways. And just, you know, to, to summarise very briefly, um, We've used an evidence base and we feel that using that evidence base, it's been demonstrated that the, the site will not have a material impact on capacity or operation of the network. There's no highway safety issues um, that the scheme's going to create or it won't have a detrimental impact on safety. The proposed access arrangements are suitable, meet all necessary technical guidance, and the site is in a highly sustainable location that maximises the ability of people to travel by non-car modes. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Simon. Very appreciated that. Right. Uh, does anybody have any questions for either Simon or Andy? Right. So, uh, Councillor Platt first. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm not against this site. I think it'll be a fantastic site once it's finished uh, and very much needed. But on his report, twenty-six and page twenty-six and twenty-seven. Paragraph 2 and Paragraph 7, it clearly says that the residential scheme is to provide a maximum of 115 houses or dwellings, it says. Now, I'm asking the question is, why have you let the developer put in a proposal of 139 houses? Chair, okay, I'll take that one if I may. Paul, is that you? It is, Chair. Apologies, yes. I'll take that yeah, you, you, You'll come in, Paul, yes. Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, it's... Um, very difficult one at times to, to answer. The obviously we have to, uh, we've had this before from members. We have the local plan uh, which identifies sites for housing and numbers in, in which apply to those sites. The local plan, however, is only one consideration we need to take into account. The local plan was adopted in 2014, over six years ago now. Um, I'm now giving a short presentation later on the local plan, updating where we are on that, but. One of the key considerations we need to consider is the local plan update and still in um, assessing plan applications. One of the criteria we use in looking at housing schemes, housing um, proposals, is do we have a five-year housing land supply? 
or do we meet the housing delivery test? The answer to both is yes, we do. And so therefore the plan can be considered up to date. So when we are, what that basically means is that we can use it to resist those housing developments in locations which we don't want, principally those on un unallocated sites. However, we still need to consider the local plan against the provisions of the MPPF to ensure those policies are still consistent with what the MPPF is saying. One of the key issues in the MPPF is that, um, which has come forward since we produced the local, is that it identifies that we should be making most effective and efficient use of land, and we should be setting minimum standards and minimum number of housing sites and not maximum. So in that context, the maximum element in the, um, the policy is probably seen as being not consistent with national planning policy framework and national policy. However, that is not to say that there is a free for all for developers. Um, it is still quite heavily laden that um, they, the design still needs to be correct. Um, if it's an inappropriate design, that's a sufficient reason to turn around and say, nope, don't like it. Um, also, um, the other issue that um, in that is it'd probably be picked up is the impacts upon infrastructure and so forth. That it still needs that still needs the number proposed. In addition to that, we also have the, um, I think as Andy alluded to in his presentation, we also have the requirement in the local plan about if we feel that the requirement or the design is such that is of um, sufficient quality, that requirement can be set aside. So. Principally, the local plan does allow you to do that in the first place. Secondly, is an issue about consistency with the national planning policy framework. Hopefully, I apologize I've gone on a bit there, Chair, but I think I needed to... Start. Thank you, Paul. Jim, does that answer your question? Not really, but um, I have to accept it. But, um, it clearly says 115 maximum, but uh, my opinion, uh, the developers come in and they put as many houses up as they like, and we should look at that and, and not let them do it. Thank you. Right. Anybody else for questions? Ron Arundel, can you can you wait until it's your turn to speak? You're on you're on second next. You can ask all your questions then. Right. Anybody else ask? David Coop. Thank you, Chair. Um, question to Simon. Um, I accept what you say. However, um, coming out of that development, the only thing you can do is either turn left or right. If you turn left, you have to go into Acklam Road, which in the rush hour can be a, a nightmare. If you turn right, you've got to go uh, along through past the shops we're going to look at later. But you've got two problems. A, in the rush hour, it's horrendous. And B, it's not very good getting out on Acklam Road at the best of times. So you say about the maximum cars, if we look at the development itself, we look at the types of houses, could we perhaps say that uh, out of the 139 uh, residents there, maybe 120 or so will have some sort of car, they may not use it all the time, and there may be a certain percentage have, say, two vehicles if there's more than one person in the house. So you could have 200 cars potentially there, except the fact that may all not go to work and all at the same time. But it's just the residents will be looking at this and saying there could be another 200 cars going out that road. I'm happy to accept some of your figures, but I just wonder if you took that into account. Thanks, Chair. Simon? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think the, the key distinction to make is um, between car ownership and traffic generation. Because as you say, not everyone will go to work at the same time. Some people will be off ill, some people will be on holiday, some people will be retired. and when we do the surveys, as I said earlier, of, of residential developments, that is how we get this ratio and it's um, vehicle trips versus per, per residential dwelling during the um, peak. So it takes into account the car ownership and um, when people travel to work. You do see fluctuations as you would expect. So if you were looking at a development in the middle haven or uh, apartment type developments in the town center you would see a much lower vehicular trip generation uh, as a ratio whereas if you went to uh, a more rural location um, such as your ward you would see a higher trip generation because people can become more reliant on the car and um, because of the accessibility issues 
Does that answer your question, Councillor Coop? Uh, I think it does, but um, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. We'll have to see mm -hmm. if and when it's passed, what the development is like. I assume you do take into account, you do surveys afterwards and uh, amend your software accordingly. Thanks, Chair. Anybody else want to ask a question? Councillor Garvey. Thanks, Chair. Simon, that was the, the, the graph on the percentage of, of traffic was brilliant, and it, it was it was great to see an explanation of, of, of what the, the site would provide, i.e. a percentage of traffic. What This is more of a point on general planning when it comes to concerns about traffic, is that I thoroughly accept that this development does not add a significant amount of traffic for it to be uh, a, you know, a, a worry. But let's say in 10 years' time, someone decides to knock the school down and put 115 houses there, then what will happen is the percentage of houses that those cars create will be on top of the number of cars that are already being counted and then the percentage is going to be even less so the more hours you have you add the the lower the percentage of traffic that that the new development is is bringing to the party if you know what i mean which which is a worry so so when i see areas like this one and when you looked at the 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 graphic that you put up with the percentage of traffic off um the the various um turnings I can see a, a, a number of, of greenfield sites there that could possibly have houses on them in the future and therefore, you know, more traffic. Would you accept that? Andy? Yes, Chair, if I may come back on that, I guess Simon might want to add to it, I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah, the percentages will go down. So it, in, in, in a simple sense, it might appear that it gets, it almost gets harder and harder to then make an argument around it. But I think... It, the reality is, though, that what happens with the junctions, and Simon will correct me if I'm wrong, that there'll be a tipping point where you add more traffic to a junction, and this is what the models are designed to do. They will then show exponentially queue, queue lengths starting to get, get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it'll go from you know 100 houses adding five cars to that queue to the next 100 houses, if it's the tipping point, adding 20 cars because it's just, the network falls down, basically. So it's not that a low percentage can't be severe it's how it presents itself on those junctions and whether or not those junctions still actually um, function as as junctions but i think yeah i i totally get you what you say, what you say councillor and we do have to consider each scheme on its own merits as well which is but it, it's um it's not straightforward i guess is is one of the, one of the key things but um what we should also always remember is within you know and possibly said this before within any town or small city and um, depending where you gauge Middlesbrough you know Ackland Road, Martin Road, some of these other key roads they're the key roads into the town centre where you would expect traffic in the peak hours to be moving you don't want the traffic to go through the estates you want it to go down the main uh, traffic corridors and so traffic off Hall Drive onto Ackland Road if we ever got to the position where in the peak hour there is no queues from Hall Drive onto Ackland Road, then I think you'd probably find that Middlesbrough's got other problems because there's no one moving about. And it's, you know, traffic is not necessarily a bad thing. It's the it's how it manifests itself on those key junctions. But I think there shouldn't be an expectation that through planning or even highways interventions, we can manage out all, all sort of queuing and waiting and, and bits and pieces like that because, you know, it, it's not really how the networks are, are designed, I guess. Thanks, Andy. Councillor Wilson? Thanks, John. Thanks, Chair. I just what David Coates said there. Um, you've got 50 cent maybe uh, we'll have another car, so the two, two car families. How about the fact that you've got the, the, some of those kids with young, the young families, they've got, they've got child, 17 year old, 18 year old, they just passed the driving test. How about 139 of them, an extra one child per house? Got, they're going to buy their own car. So you could sort of be two and a half times the amount of traffic coming through there. So it's the next kind of 315 vehicles coming up there. We presumptuous there, but it's it's always there. Thanks, Chair. Andy, you want to respond? I just really reiterating Simon's comments, really, that you know, and again, 
if everyone takes into view their own street and thinks how people move yet you know every house you know they, they might own four or five cars but it doesn't mean that all those cars are moving in that peak hour it's mainly the issue here is how many cars are moving in the peak hour and these uh, models are based on um data from similar estates in similar positions and how much they put on the network so it's not to say that people won't have three cars um or some will have none but it's an average based on that peak hour um there may be days you know there might be something happen you know there's i think for instance a match day for instance where the, you might find a lot more people either walking or a lot more people getting in the car and going somewhere if there's something very big happening then you might see something that's unusual but on average then that's the sort of you know the models very much fit for purpose thanks andy councillor branson thank you chair uh, i'm just wondering whether there are any bus routes that lead from that area to the east of the town to the sports village uh, i know there are good routes north south um, but are there any routes provided or intended to be provided east west? Andy? That'd be one for Simon, if I may. Oh, Simon, there. sorry. Simon? Sorry, so we're talking about bus routes that, mm. that yes. run. Um, it, it's difficult because um, obviously the bus operators are operating commercial services um, so we have very limited control over where they choose to run their services what we can say is we work very proactively with them and we provide the necessary infrastructure to ensure uh, either bus priority or that buses have reliable journey times um, we do as much as we can on on that perspective and it's then up to uh, the bus operators to take advantage of that infrastructure okay does that, does that answer your question david well partly <laughs> i mean obviously the key thing here is that mm. um, we're trying to encourage people to use bus services i just wonder whether in fact there's any way we can make it easier uh, for bus operators to run those routes um, or, or, or even at some stage use any of the money from this development to help subsidise such a route. It's just that obviously it, you, you want to be able to get people out of cars, but if the transport route doesn't exist, if the bus route doesn't exist, that's not going to happen. That's if, a problem. If I could just come back on, on, on that, please. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, it, yeah. it, it is very difficult. Um, we, you know, this proposal if uh, members do approve it will be making a strategic highways contribution and we can consider the best way to use that that funding but i think that's the key we've got a responsibility to get the maximum benefit from the funding and and, and based of experience both at this authority and other authorities subsidizing bus services isn't necessarily always a good thing because what you ultimately want is a service to be commercially viable you don't want uh, a large amount of money to be used in a short period of time for that service to then terminate once the uh, the pump priming funding has, has ceased uh, and that can be as harmful as uh, not having a bus service in the in the first place so i think what we what we will do is we we seek to to look at the most appropriate ways of using that funding and whether it's bus priority or whether it's walking and cycling measures um but again this is where the model comes in because we can look at more strategic interventions um, that derive benefit over bigger areas instead of just something that only benefits a handful of residents okay thanks that's, that's what i want to know thanks chair can i just add to that sorry yes you can andy yes um the scheme i believe simon is in 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 intending to make provisions for improvements to bus stops on i think it's whole drive um which obviously helps to encourage uh bus sort of patronage it doesn't necessarily change the routes and things but it improves the 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 sort of uh likelihood or the desirability of people uh using public yeah, that, that's correct. Things like uh, the provision of the improved lighting, um, real-time displays to make to make using the bus a bit more attractive. 
Uh, thank you. I could see I could see Councillor Palano has got his hand up, but I don't think I can let you speak, Eric, because you you're not a member of the committee, and you haven't indicated that you wanted to speak on this item. You were down to speak on agenda on the second one, which is the one that I think is in your award. So I think if I let you speak on this as a non-member, I think that Emma Loughran would put my head in my hands. So I'm okay. sorry, but I'm sorry, but I can't let you go. Okay, no problem. Sorry, Eric. Councillor Nugent. Yes, I just wanted to say to Simon that there currently are two bus services that run along Hall Drive, which then bypasses this new item of ours, the second one today, and they run through Tollsby. So there are currently two bus services there. Okay, at the moment. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so, <coughs> Councillor Wilson, you had your hand raised again. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just might be a bit of useless information, but years ago, these few bus ran out of uh, the town centre, up Cafe Lane, Long Lackey Lane, all the way along to Acton Road and down Acton Road in the town. It's like it's just like a route. Uh, I don't know why that stopped. I think it was just the the L bus or the M bus. I'm going back a few years now. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else got a hand raised? No, I can't see anybody. Right, very well. Andy and Simon have answered the questions that were asked of them. We'll now go to some other people who wish to speak on the application. Um, this first person will be the agent. Now, our legal representative will monitor the time taken by each applicant, agent or objector to present their case. The legal representation will also advise once the time allocation has expired. So we now have the agent, Mr. Stephen Litherland. Are you with us, Mr. Litherland? Mr. Litherland, you need to press um, star six on mute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can indeed. You've got Sorry five minutes, you. Mr. Leatherland. Off you go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think the, the officers, Andrew and, um, and Simon, have set up the, the planning position clearly there. And I'll try and address some of the points that the councils have been raising there through the, the questions as I go through this. Um, just, just to reiterate, though, that the band have been working in collaboration with the council officers and, and the other consultees within the council for over a year on these proposals. We think through the, the collaboration with officers, we've arrived at a high quality and well-designed scheme that's um, once constructed going to enhance the local area. Just in, in planning policy terms, I just want to draw out some very key points without, um, without um, repeating what the officers said verbatim. Um, firstly, the site, as, as, as has been mentioned, mainly consists of previously developed land being the grounds of a, a school, which has now been cleared. All national and local planning policies supportive of the redevelopment of previously developed sites like this one. Um, the site's allocated under policy H34, as we've heard, of the Middlesbrough Local Plan for residential development. Therefore, we think the principle of residential development on the site's um, well established in pol planning policy terms. So in collaboration with the officers, we've, um, we've worked to each of the criteria, as Andrew went through there in the, in the presentation, set out by policy H34, to ensure the scheme that does everything that's, that's, that's been asked of it, really. I think I acknowledge the points that, um, that some of the, the councillors have raised there regarding the maximum. So we acknowledge the scheme consists of 139 dwellings, which is more than the 115 that's listed in the policy. Um, notwithstanding this, as has been explained and, and answered by the, the officers, we consider the site to be capable of accommodating the quantum of development proposed, both in terms of the on-site and off-site impact. Um, and given the high quality design that we have put forward, we think that in these circumstances, um, the, the policy H1 of the local plan um, does, does cover, cover the, the increase in the number. Um, just trying to address some of the objections. I see that one of the key objections clearly relates to, to highways. Again, we've been working in collaboration with the council um, with regard to the highway impact. Um, we've plugged our scheme into your AIMSON uh, model, the traffic model that Simon's been mentioning on, on the, the call there. This demonstrates that the additional vehicle movements can be accommodated in the highway network without any severe impact. Um, we've also considered um, the neighbouring properties in terms of how they sit with the scheme along Cowley Road and Adcock Road in particular. We made sure that the properties along the northern edge of the scheme uh, are offset in excess of the standard separation distances required by the Council's um, planning department. 
And also, just um, what I want to do to finish, really, just to set out some of the key economic, social, and um, environmental benefits that, that come with the scheme. Um, 139 dwellings, 15% on-site affordable housing, two, three, four, and five bedroom family homes, sustainable urban drainage systems, increased pedestrian links um, into the wider, wider locality, new proposed access point on St. David's Way and the upgrade of St. David's Way to bring that up to adoptable standards. Within the scheme, new areas of landscape, public open space, creating attractive public realm areas. Um, also, direct and indirect employment. A scheme such as this um, supports um, um, 430 direct and indirect jobs, and many of these will be for the, the Middlesbrough local area. Um, it'll generate around 1.675 million in tax revenue. That's stamp duty, land tax, corporation tax, national insurance, PYE, etc. And also 156,000 um, or thereabouts in annual council tax revenue. We're also providing off-site sports pitches, as we've heard over on the Outwood Academy. Um, as an offset for the pitches that, that currently, or sorry, that were on the, the school site. And also through the Section 106 agreement and the capital receipt captured from the site, um, financial contributions in excess of a million pounds as well. Uh, so to conclude, we hope we've done enough to demonstrate to members that the collaborative working um, on the scheme with the council uh, means that this will be a positive scheme for the local area and for Middlesbrough more widely. And, um, and we'd respectfully ask the committee to support the officer's recommendation. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has on, on the proposals. Thank you, Mr. Litherland. Anybody got any questions for him? Sheila? Sheila Dean? You're on mute, Sheila. Okay. Okay, yeah, Sheila. Sheila. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the entrance into St David's. Um, is it going to be widened because it's not a very, it's quite a narrow road down there to get in there. Um, yeah. And I'm also concerned about all the traffic coming out onto Acklam Road. You know, it's, I mean, it's all right saying it won't increase that much, but 139 houses, it's bound to. Thank you. Yeah, just in terms of your, your your question about St David's, yes, the idea is that that is widened, um, and also um, I think Simon had the the scheme up on on the slides earlier on. Um, it's widened to adoptable standards, so the council will will end up adopting St David's Way all the way down to the site access. Um, the, your point about traffic, I think I think has been covered in the presentation from Simon, and, and I'd say the same thing. We've we've plugged the development into the traffic model. Um, the numbers come out of the model that's um, the council's model. That's, been independently audited, as Simon said, um, and we don't think that there'll be a severe impact from the from the traffic that comes from this scheme to, to warrant refusal of the planning application. Thank you, Mr. Litherland. Anybody else Thank got you. any questions for him? Councillor Rostron? Hmm. You're on mute, Julia. Am I back? Yeah. Yeah, you're back. It keeps going for some reason. Sorry yeah, about mine's, that. Mine's the same. It's got a mind of its own. <laughs> um, I was concerned about the increase in the number of, of properties that were going to be built on the site because 115 to 139 is almost 25% increase. Mm. Um, and I, it wasn't from a traffic point of view. It was a point, from the point of view of the density of the site. Now, if those computer-generated um, pictures are accurate, then... It does allay my concerns because it does look like you know there is a sufficient space between the houses and such like so really just wanted to ask mr Litherland, are those um, images that we saw accurate yeah absolutely yeah the architects pre pre prepare them images from computer generated um generated images from a cad file so they're accurate to to, to quite um quite accurate capability actually okay. thank you thank you anybody else Councillor Coop, I can see your hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, just to go back to the traffic. Um, as I said earlier on, Acklam Road is, is, is not a very good place to go down at, uh, at rush hour times. I'm very pleased to see you've got cycle routes planned, you've got pedestrian routes planned, that's, that's good. Um, I'm not quite sure whether walking down to the shops at Acklam and back with a whole load of groceries would be a main thing but if going down for small amounts people would hopefully do it and i would encourage people to do that 
um, getting out onto Ackland Road is, uh, is not so good. So I'm pleased about that. But do you still foresee, if you do that site, that there will be um, more use of cycleways and less use of cars? Thank you. Mr. Litherland? I hope so. Um, obviously, the site is sustainably located, as we've all seen there. The, the, there's various things around it, shops, services, schools, access to bus stops. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's highly likely that some people will take advantage of that and walk to places and, and potentially um, use the bus service as well. Thank you, Mr. Litherland. Anybody else? Can't see any more hands. No? Okay. So we'll carry on. There are no objectors who said they wish to speak. Um, so we now turn to the Ward Councillor, Councillor Arundel, who represents Cader Ward. Would you like to speak, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, for your indulgence, I shall read from a prepared, prepared text. Uh, and then at some point, I wish to ask questions of, of officers. Course. Okay. Yep, no trouble. Although I accept houses should be built on this brownfield site, I submit this application in its present form should be rejected because of the numbers of dwellings submitted. My two reasons for objecting are traffic and a failure to comply with the local plan. Firstly, traffic. This site, this site has one access road, so it's St David's Wedge, which in turn leads to an already congested and collapsing road or drive. It's a difficult junction on onto Ackland Road, which has already been spoken about, and a, pre and a present experience huge tailbacks at that peak period, and is a nightmare to turn right off, which has already been spoken about. At meetings with a rep from our bank, I had hoped to mitigate the traffic issue by requesting a substantial number of bungalows to be built on that site. The logic of that being that the normally people living in bungalows are retired and therefore don't necessarily have to drive at peak periods. The result of that is that we've got five, and I believe that's part of the, the social con social houses contributions to the site. Regard to the local plan, it quite clearly states there is not there is to be a maximum of 115 houses on that site, not the suggested 139, and I fear the design quality asked for in the local plan is compromised by the added numbers, and I'm concerned the criteria in the local plan will not be met Bearing in mind the surrounding properties are all sizable high-end properties, adding 24 to the original 115 quoted in the local plan must affect, and in fact I believe does, impact on, on, the, on the, that, the, the, the quality of those properties and they don't match the existing character of the area. If you look at some of those, uh, they are very, very small houses, really, really totally out of character with the houses that surround them in that area. Now, some might ask why I haven't raised the local plan earlier. It is quite simple. When I asked the plan officer some time ago about the 115 figure, I was told that was the minimum number for that site, which I took at their word. And it was only when I just recently read the local plan I discovered the correct facts. Now, football pitches. Can I have some clarity on that, please? Are they inside or outside of the fenced area? that exists on Sandy Flats Field. Andy, can you take yeah. that? I can reshare the slide if that's... Uh, that would help, Andy, yes. Yeah. Helpful. Um, just give me two seconds. Let's get back to this slide in question. So, if members can see that, this is the Outward Academy. Can't see it. Can't see it yet. There it is. I am now, yes. Yeah. So, the yellow dot or yellow circle is where the pitches would be. This is the Avenue of Trees. This is the Outward yes. Academy. Yes, I know the area very well. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's in this it's, area. It's, it, it would be, according to me, that would be on the opposite side of the footpath to the fenced-in area on Outward Academy and uh, Cader, yeah. Cader Football Club. Is that correct? I think that's the Council Arundale. I think the footpath you're talking about runs along there, doesn't it? Along that's the, right. Between the two, yeah. So it's on the opposite side. 
to the to the to the footpath that, that outward economy is. Yes. To the cade, yeah. Yeah. Well that area at present is 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 scrub, scrubland, yeah. yeah? Yep. But it's been planted up with oak, oak trees, young oak trees. It's occupied by young oak trees at the present. So you, you're talking about putting pitches on the scrubland? Well, there's pitches have to be basically done to what we call Sport England standard. They're, they're the benchmark for what's appropriate and what's not. So the, the scheme required requires some land levelling works. There's been a soil assessment to understand the soil build-up whether it's sandy, whether it's clay, whatever it is, and there's a requirement then to put put material down to make an appropriate pitch, an appropriately drained pitch into the right um, the right gradients that are required by pitches. So it's not just a case of um, allowing the applicant to go and sort of put markings on there and expect people to use it as a football pitch and then cut the grass. They have to be formally. Well, I, I realise that. I realise that. The pitches. So I, I understand now where, where you're looking to put them. And as I say, at the present moment in time, it's at the bottom of the of the crematorium site, and it's um, it's scrubland at the moment. As yeah, I so say, that's... and people have planted oak trees on there in the last number of years. There's young oak trees over that already. Will, will those oak trees be recited? The I mean, trees can be recited, yeah. We've got to finalise this by through 106, but ultimately there's, there's sort of roughly about 180, 180,000 pounds of the works to form to form these three right. pitches. Um, so and, that will be and that will be permanently open to the public? Yeah, that's the intention, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, can I turn to Simon? Yes, you can, Ron. Okay. Simon, um... I think the only good thing to say about this, as far as I'm concerned, is that you're looking to reduce that plateau but, uh, that's there, uh, speed re uh, restricting plateau that, that where at St David's uh, joins uh, Hall Drive. We have issue. I've had issues there with, with residents near that who have got complaints about the buses coming off that plateau and vibrating their houses. So I'm pleased that that's going to happen, and hope whatever you put in there bears that in mind that the buses will not that come from the school and what have you, will not um, do the same. Another general question you ask of you, Simon, is can you tell me of any planner application that's been turned down by yourselves or modified because of highways issues? I'm not sure what the relevance of the of the question is to be honest we, we take each site on its own merits and we assess each scheme um against uh the relevant standards guidance and uh, the output of the model uh, and on this specific scheme uh, we believe it's been demonstrated that it won't have a material harm the, there is a presumption in favor of development um however we you know I think it does need to be borne in mind that we are the highway authority and we're responsible for making sure our network operates as efficiently and effectively as it can. So it is in our interest to effectively create problems for ourselves. Right, further to that, can you say that the footpaths or whatever you're along that area will be flagged rather than tarmac because you don't want to um, poison the trees? Is that the case? Yeah, um, as as is the case on a number of schemes, we have to modify construction um, to take into account ground conditions. And where we've got trees in the local area, we would seek um, as a responsible authority to minimise the risk of any damage to those trees. All right. It's just that wherever there's problems with tree roads lifting flags, you tend to put tarmac around them. It doesn't seem to add up to me, the two. I think maybe I'll, if I come back on that one, Chair, I mean... Yeah, I think you should, Andy, yes. What what the council's maintenance people do and what is appropriate in design terms might be two different things. One will be borne out by what we consider to be appropriate and good design, and one might be borne out by cost. But I'm, I don't want to particularly comment on what does or doesn't happen on repairs. But the the principle of um, tarmac going down round tree roots, obviously, is the tarmac gets damaged, and then you've got to lay long sections of tarmac. Whereas yeah. paving slabs can be lifted as individual things and then relayed to, to just a small area, but 
the, the thing with the, the things like the tree roots and things obviously tree roots travel a, a distance and paving slabs um allow water to still penetrate through not significantly but they still allow that to happen so it's generally accepted um that they create less of an issue for for tree roots and, and long the long-term sustainability of, of, of landscaping well, i understand what you're saying there but it, the, the fact of the matter is that there will be people visit that area in cars to walk the avenue of trees and no doubt because the, the road is quite narrow i know you're talking about making it a bit wider but they will park on the pavement or park on the pavement and we'll finish up with broken paving slabs, which eventually the council's given up on replacing uh, um, paving slabs because of that issue now and the tarmac now. So it seems to be a contradiction there, you know, that um, one part of the service is saying we should we should do away with flags and put tarmac down because of car damage. And now we're saying we should put flags down uh, for a different reason. So I'm quite concerned that we put flags down and then we have to go back some time later and replace them all. Because the, the standard flagstones we get now, to be quite honest, they're total rubbish. They're not built for cars to They're built for people to walk on, not for cars to park on. And unfortunately, cars park on them. And I'll just conclude and say to the, to, the, to the panel, in conclusion, I ask you to consider refusing the application in its present form for the reasons I've stated. And I amended proposal in line with the local plan that's for 115 houses be submitted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Right. I think all the evidence has now been received. Do any of the members want to ask any of the officers a question before we go into some discussion to see if we can find a proposal? <laughs> Councillor Dodds, you wish to say something else? Yeah, it's an aspect to, uh, as Councillor Arundel has just mentioned, on St David's Way, that cars will park on the pavement. Can the developer not use raised curbs so that the car can't park on the pavements the way that it was done in um, Hall Drive to stop them, not Hall Drive, um, Church Lane and that area down to the Green Lane School? So that stopped the parents um, parking on the pavement. Could that not be adopted there? Raised curbs so that cars couldn't get up there. Just a point, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Chair, do you want me to quickly just... Just go through that, Andy, yes. Absolutely. Simon and the highways team can come up with a, you know, it's been raised as a concern. Um, clearly, people might well park down there. In fact, they're, they're slightly encouraged to park down there to use the avenue of trees, etc. And they obviously do that at the moment. So the, the design that is agreed moving forwards can take that into account. It can be raised curbs. It can be things to reduce that, you know, you can't always stop everyone minded to do that. But the design, we should design out that as much as we can. That's just, that's good design and that from what members are saying i think simon will be fully i'm sure he has already but i'm he'll be able to fully take that into account moving forwards thank you andy right councillor platt you wish to say something again yes can i make a proposal if, it, if it's no, uh, not, not yes not yes wait, not wait. Yet. okay i'll wait until I'll, you tell I'll, me that. I'll tell you when yeah right no more questions from anybody right Okay, if Andy will read out the recommendations from the committee report, please. Yes, Chair. The the recommendation is to it's approved subject to a section one oh six agreement. I think um I would just like to touch on one point. Obviously that people or others mentioned that it's failing local plan policy because of the numbers. Policy H one specifically says schemes can go above the maximum within the other poli within the other housing policy so i think to say it's failing that policy would be uh, incorrect and any inspector were it to be refused on that basis without clear justification the, the inspectors will not put aside policy h1 they will read all the policies as a consist as a comprehensive group of policies and policy h1 says if it's a sufficient design quality then um, you know there's a re you can go beyond that 115 with the individual policy. So I just want to make that that point, Chair. It, it's I think members were maybe feeling that it's it's contrary to to policy and arguably it's it's not. It becomes down to the opinion and then it's 
evidence in. If there is a motion to, to go against it, it needs to be very clearly evidenced what the implications are and what aspects of the scheme aren't meeting those policy uh, uh, aspirations. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much. Right, so we'll ask the committee now. This is your chance, Jim. Do you like to come and make some proposals as to what we do with this application? Councillor Platt? Yes, can I make a proposal that we pass the application, Mr. Brownfield's site, but we make a maximum of 115 houses, which is in the local plan. Right. I don't know whether we can do that. Can we do that, Paul? No, Chair, we can't. The application no. is for 139. No, we have to deal with we have to deal with it as it is, 115. We can't change it at this meeting. We're dealing with a simple planning application and we can't change the numbers on it. We as a committee can't change the numbers on it. We could possibly defer the application for another day to have further talks on it. I don't know. Emma, have you got any thoughts on it? Um, if that's what um, members are thinking, if they would prefer it to be deferred to get more information, um, whether they want more clarification on stuff or want Andy or Paul to go back um, to the developer, but sort of there's been extensive information already given to members. Yes, that so. has, yeah. The, the only more information we could get was whether we could change the numbers. Yeah. So, so Chair, if members want to defer the, the application for information, we can do that. However, it would be helpful to understand what additional information it is that members want us to look at and to gather before we, we bring that, um, before we go back to the developer to have those discussions to bring it back to the committee. Councillor Platt has just said that. He said he wants it taken back to the original number that's in the local plan. The original total number that's in the local plan. Yeah, obviously the applicant's aware of that number. We've heard the agent on the on the call. Um, it's obviously possibly for the agent to comment on maybe, but the, the, they've submitted the application for 139, knowing what the local plan policies are and looking at the traffic implications and all those aspects. So they are aware of that. And this is the application before members. Um, I mean, by all means, ask the agent if they want to consider the numbers. Um, is he, is he still with us? Is he still with us, uh, um, Georgina? Yes, he is, Chair. Could we ask him if we can if we can call him in, Mr. Litherland? Mr. Litherland, do you want to press stand six to unmute your microphone, please? Mr. Litherland, do you want to press star six to unmute your microphone, please? Yeah, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Litherland, we've, we've had a proposal that um, we would accept the would accept the application as long as the numbers were changed back to the original numbers, which were for 115 dwellings. Could you change it back to that? Is it is it in your remit to do that I sort think of thing? That's diff difficult to do without speaking to my client in, in a little bit more detail. I suspect that the answer would be we wanted to stick with 139, um, but. I will have to check that with my client before I'm able to confirm one way or another, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Litherland. So, well, how do the rest of the committee feel? Do we feel that we could defer it and go back, or do people want to press on and... Nobody saying anything? Chair, can I just... Sorry. Yes, yes, Andy, it, it come just maybe to assist members thinking on this, that... 115 is a number. If if it comes back with 115 uh, houses with more bedrooms in, then it doesn't necessarily reduce traffic on the site because there's more people within the houses. It might not mean more bricks and mortar on the site because it can be larger houses. So it's important not to get kind of fixated necessarily on a number because the number doesn't necessarily dictate whether it's high quality or not as an environment. And that's really where this development's gone. It's been pushed and pushed and pushed to provide a high quality environment that people walk through and live in and all the rest of it. So I'd just be a little bit, um, I suppose, just really raising that. The number itself is, you know, in doing that, asking the, the, the applicant who's arguably spent tens of thousands of pounds submitting the application and, and a lot more designing it and going through all the, the modeling and everything. Um, 
what it'd be interesting on, on, it'd be useful to know what members want out of less numbers of houses what is, specifically is it that they're looking for or is it just that this just looking at this number on the on the local plan policy that's that's there thank you chair you're on mute councillor coop Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I do understand where uh, Councillor Platt's coming from, but as has been just pointed out, one of the problems is if you um, decrease the number of houses, you could well increase the size of them. So you'd end up with four and five bedroom houses rather than three and four bedroom houses. So you may still have a problem with traffic because they may have two, maybe three, maybe even, dare I say, four cars. So I don't think that would take away from the problem. Uh, as, as I see it, the main problem is access. It's, a, it's volume of cars, it's various other bits and pieces. So it's it's difficult to say whether going away would come back to how they feel. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Garvey, do you have another proposal to make? Yes, Chair. I propose we accept the application because I'm just not confident that um, it would be nice to have fewer houses and less traffic, um, but I'm just not confident that we can say no and be justified. So I propose that we, we accept it. We have a second for that. Councillor Rushton, are you seconding that? I'll second it, yeah. Right. Okay. You have to speak again, Jim. Go on, then. Yes, it's all about numbers. I mean, you could put 200 houses on there. It doesn't matter. The uh, local plan says 115, and we should stick with that. All the time when developers come forward, they'll put as many houses on any site as they want to put on, providing the planning people let them. Because we quoted the numbers 150,000 from the council tax. Well, we only get 40% of people pay the full council tax anyway, so that number is out of the question. It's all about numbers. The original plan was 115, and we should stick by that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, we've had a proposal now from Councillor Garvey we, that we accept the proposal as it is. We've had a seconder from Councillor Rostron, which says the same. So we can now go and have a vote. Now, I'm going to read out everybody's names, as we usually do. And remember, we're voting on the application. So the application is for if we agree, against if we disagree, and abstain if you can't make your mind up. Are we all clear on what we're voting on? Anybody want anything more? No? Okay, so we'll make a start. We'll start at the back. We'll go for Councillor Wilson first. You're on mute, Councillor Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Abstain. Abstain, right. Councillor Dean. Again. Strun. Four. Councillor Ostrun, four. Councillor Platt, against. Against, yes. Councillor Nugent. Councillor, can't hear you. I'll send you a... I'll, I'll send you a request to unmute, Mary. I think she's saying four, but I'm not sure. I know, I think, yeah, she is, I think. Councillor, if you're saying four, put your thumbs up like that. <laughs> Councillor Nugent, four. Yeah. Councillor Garvey. Four, chair. <laughs> Councillor Dodds. Four. Councillor Branson. Four. Councillor Coop. Four, Chair. Councillor Hobson. Four.
Chair, I can confirm that seven of the ten members have voted to approve the application. Two have refused the application and one of us abstained. Okay. So we can now confirm that the vote following the decision of the committee is to approve the planning application. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's taken a long time to do that, hasn't it? <laughs> right, so we'll go straight in with with um, the second application, which is Kwood Drive Stroke Revo Drive. Once again, before I hand over to Andy, can I ask that all committee members refrain from asking questions in his, till he's finished his presentation? So, Andy, would you like to uh, open up your screen for us, please? I think he's just having an issue he, getting back on he, chair. He's gone somewhere. Yeah, I think it, it must just be connectivity issues. He's trying right. to get back on now. Paul, could you possibly... Could you take over, Paul? I'm just um, trying to get myself up to see if I've got a presentation and uh, familiarise myself with the report. Well, Lee, Lee Garvey could probably sing us a song while we're waiting. Could you sing, Lee? No, you just... I'm physically, but it's not something you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, OK. Um... I will make a stab at uh, presenting this for you, Chair. Right, off you go, Paul. I'm sure when Andy comes back, we'll take over. Right. I'll get the right presentation. Oh. I'll share my screen. Right, can, can members see my screen? Okay. Uh, hopefully that says mixed use development foreground for retail units, 24 apartments, parking and landscape for a new bridge port and shops. Right. Right. Um, I will apologise in advance. I'm not as familiar with this application as Andy is, so I will apologise for my foot. Okay, as I say, uh, members will be um, aware that um, the scheme, um, the Tolkien Shop scheme off of Kaywood Drive, Revo, um, Revo Drive, has um, it's been an area which is um, obviously, from the locals' put perspective, has had um, an area uh, they've obviously seen significant improvement to over a number of years, uh, particularly the lack of shops within the area. There's been a lot of, of pressure to bring the site forward for, for development. It was um, or was a site which was uh, a number of retail units, a, I believe there was a garage on site as well, with um, re residential um, above. The site also, which is excluded from this application, includes what, what, what is the Endeavour Park in that location. If you, if you ever get back in, Annie, you want to jump in, please feel free to do so. Um, this overall, this this um, slide shows the site from the, the um, aerial um, view of the site as it was. Um, but the building has since been developed. Uh, sorry, it has since been demolished. Um, access, vector access, was taken from both Kaywood and Revo, with parking between um, behind the retail units. This, um, this slide shows the general location of the, the uh, application site um, within the, the broader Actum area. The application, so to, to your left, you've got the Actum Hall development, um, to the right, sort of skill. Um, Paul, do you want me to, I'm back on now, sorry. Yeah, for that. probably, if you probably know this in a bit more detail than I did, I could probably easier take over the last one, this one, be for honest, but yeah, um, if you don't mind, Andy. Can you operate the slides for me, Paul? If Not a okay. problem. Sorry about that, Chair. Sincere apologies. Um, so after this slide, we've got, if we move on to the next slide, 
displays. We've got a few photographs, I think, of the site prior to demolition. Um, this is a frontage onto Revo Drive. Members probably know this more than I do. It was a former uh, car repair type garage uh, and the precinct with the, the shops and the flats above is off to the left hand side. If we can move across the slide. This is another view from the opposite side of Revo and this is the sort of parking and service in the back of the shops. And you can see on the right hand side, the sort of uh, curtilage, the residential boundaries along there. I think it's a bungalow on the, the nearest property. I think members will get a feel for this. And remember that obviously Tolsby was a, a design and of its time, not particularly great by the end of its uh, end of its life. But it, that's obviously gone now. But um, if we have a look at the next slide, Paul, please. Apologies. And so it was very much a service inside at this at this back end facing towards the properties. That's the car park area. Again, the back of the, the premises and on the right hand side, we've got the uh, the Endeavour pub with the blue doors and the blue trim above the flat roof. That's just again shows it in context of residential gardens. Ne next slide, please. This is the precinct which was facing the houses. So the shops at ground floor, the flats above and then the houses uh, on the site, which uh, fairly closely related thank you paul and this is what what i sort of call the the pedestrian precinct the walkway from kwood drive through to revo with the endeavor pub on the side and then you can see that the the former shops in the distance there thank you paul there was a previous approval for the site for a three-story building and that in the, was going to propose well that proposed an approved three sorry retail units on the ground floor which were inward facing to the car park on the south side there and then two stories of flats uh, essentially above that as well um largely in the same position as the previous but just flipping the the frontage of the the, the retail so moving on to the proposed development um the considerations are within the report including the objections and comments of concern that have been raised there's 85 neighbour letters that were sent out, out by the council and we've received six objections in response. The main consideration is that it, it's going to overshadow bungalows, too many apartments, parking will be a problem for existing residents, parking levels below the council standards, there's already too much traffic in the area, there's a roof terrace proposed as part of this scheme and that it's felt that that will result in a loss of privacy and suggestion that the building should be distanced further from properties on Revo, taking into account the position of living room windows um you'll see from this slide the proposed building looks like it's two blocks on the left hand side and the right hand side essentially it's actually a horseshoe because there's a bit in between the middle bit there at the northern side the top side which joins at first and second floor with so it's got but it's got a park, car parking on the on the ground floor area um the proposal gained access off Revo Drive, pretty much in the position where the access was shown on the photographs where it was previously. There's some parking on Redro Revo Drive, sort of pulling bays, and then the rest of the parking is internal, largely in the position as, as where some of it was private, provided previously. The former access on Kaywood linked through from Kaywood to Revo, so that would arguably be a rat run if, if that was retained through through the site. This proposal doesn't intend to retain that. It, it intends to basically fence off that. So pedestrian and vehicle movements will not happen from Kaywood through this site. Um, and it's intended to recurb its vehicular access onto Kaywood. So that would do away with the vehicular uh, movements onto that piece of piece of land. Um, if we can just look at the next slide, please, Paul. All the ground floor areas here are either retailing or ancillary space associated with a flat so the light blue is a single what you'd call an anchor retail store it's got um storerooms out the back and it's got an internal bin store so um within the building there's a smaller pink retail store that also has an internal bin store and then there's two other retail stores on the on the opposite block then in brown, you've got the two apartment, uh, so the sort of stair cores, the lift cores for the apartments and the lobby areas. And then at the back of that, you've got a bin store and cycle store for the apartments as well. All the parking within that central bit is intended to be for the residential apartments. And if you see the route through from Revo, the pedestrian route through between the parking and the retail, the blue retail stores, that leads to a, a effectively a pedestrian crossing 
which then links up very closely to the doors within the retail scheme on the other two sites. So it, it tries to keep all the retail in at the, that side of the site rather than moving further up into where the residential accesses and residential parking is. And just have a look at the next slide, please, Paul. This shows the first and second floor plans. The, the, they're identical. The blue apartments are two bed. The salmon or pink apartments are one bed and the brown areas are the sort of core stairs and, and corridors for the apartment blocks. On the left hand side, you'll see some white areas which are hatched. They're kind of, in, I'll call them it internal balcony, kind of like an alcove balcony. And we'll see that a bit more on some of the other images. There's no balconies on the eastern side. These are just in the western block. So that's the first and second floor. And then the third floor um, is only on one side of the building on Terevo. Um, and that shows a, a wraparound balcony around three sides serving those apartments. The balcony on the south side, you can see there's a gray area which is not hatched with the lines that would just be a flat roof so the balcony set back there and that's to reduce impacts on privacy from overlooking of the nearby bungalows on the, on the on the south side and there's a roof terrace in the middle bit which is intended to be a communal space for all the people in the apartments that they can use as effectively a sitting out area um there's no other sitting out areas because it's mainly parking and, and, and retail so that's intended to provide that function for those people uh, for in, for internally um we do have some computer generated images here um which should show, show a bit like the previous application these are computer generated images from the plans that have been submitted so we've got three stories and if you look at the very the front corner here you can see the balconies that i was mentioning so that's effectively a balcony there's brickwork in between and it's just almost like window size openings within that those balconies just to give people a little bit of sitting out space it's not a, a projecting overhanging balcony like you'd normally anticipate through that term being used and that helps to limit the view from those properties to the bungalows that live opposite so the officers feel is that the the implications of the balconies have largely been designed out of this sort of normal overlooking that you might get from a balcony. Um, I think hopefully the images kind of demonstrate that it's quite a high quality scheme. It's intended to be brick. The upper floors set back, the uppermost floor on the front onto Revo is set back and using different materials to try and subdue its, its impact rather than appearing like a full four storey building. It's tried to reduce that down, that, that visual dominance down. Um, so this is a 3D view from sort of high up looking in again off Revo. You can see the courtyard parking for the residential. You can see the two blocks. And I think it's worth saying you can see the retail units at the back there. One of them is actually single story and then curves around. So that adds a little bit of change and, and, and interest to the, the overall scale and, and, and design of the development. Um, can we have a look at the, the, the next ones? Yeah, more of the same really just gives it from a different angle, the parking relationship with the building and how the building then relates to the Endeavour public house. Um, I think ultimately the, the scheme is going to assist in providing the local area with retailing. Again, it will be able to serve the immediate and the wider area as a neighbourhood centre. It will allow non um, car journeys essentially to be made by local people and it will help to therefore improve the sustainability for these people. The assumption would be since the previous um, shops closed that people are having to get in the car to then go or, or, or walk a greater distance to get these provisions. So it, it will should help and put that back into the community. Um, local plan policy CS13 relates to the hierarchy of centres for Middlesbrough and it encourages convenient and accessible uh, neighbourhood centres like this to meet the day-to-day -day needs. So it's, it's policy compliant. The presence of the apartments, obviously it will assist in giving the site activity and vit vitality within the evening, it'll help the natural surveillance in the areas. I think a lot of members will probably appreciate where you've just got shop. The areas to the rear of shops is where kids congregate and all the rest of it, they can cause problems for having apartments associated with this, which overlook and have to, the, the occupiers of the apartment use the space around it, helps to reduce some of those potential implications uh, in, in future. So it's designing out issues, if you like. Um, I mean, I'm happy to pick up on any points here. I don't think I want to particularly go on too much with this one because it's all within the report. We, yeah, yeah. We've got 
a recommendation to approve it's subject to conditions the conditions will deal with things like the quality of materials the hours of use for the retailing the deliveries the refuse off-site highway works to sort out all the, bits, the sort of if you like the messy bits of highway ar around the site that need sorting out the landscape provision boundary treatments any screening required for these balconies um drainage we've asked for an obscure blazing scheme because some of the a couple of the windows we do need to ensure that they are obscurely glazed to not unduly affect privacy so we've got a condition to pick that up um there's one thing that's been asked by the applicant actually since the report was put forward and that's the condition 10 which is method of work statement and condition 14 which is noise from the public house um potentially um, that they aren't pre-commencement conditions, Chair. So, and, th and that's fine. We, they're not asking that they those matters aren't dealt with. They're just asking that those matters can be dealt with post-commencement on site were permission to be granted. And that's fine. We can devise the conditions. Uh, officers can do that if members are happy to just allow that to be um, maybe pre, uh, sorry, before the development starts building out of the ground so the foundations and bits and pieces can be dealt with so that's officers if members are happy officers can deal with that so that's just a slight change to the recommendation chair thank you thanks andy any other members wish to ask andy any questions on that councillor branson yeah thank you chair uh, i notice there's a dog leg um that's been blocked off which is next to the endeavor pub uh, I'm just a bit concerned that that won't become an area for antisocial behaviour if it's left in that way. And I wonder whether it would not be a good idea um, incorporating it in the parking area of the Endeavour pub and using that as parking, extra parking facilities for people wishing to use the centre. That's just a suggestion. Andy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's uh, very much a thought that um, uh, the officers have had as well, uh, councillor. Um, importantly, we, we've we've asked the applicant to de clearly define what, how that's going to be tret in terms of whether it's vehicles coming through or pedestrians, and and the applicant's done that. So it's not intended to be used really as part of the development. So the the applicant then really needs to think about how they're going to use it long term. Absolutely, it's not it's difficult for us to do because they're not using it. It's part of the site, but they're not using it as part of this scheme. So they'll have to really come back and sort that out through this application we can't enforce that the the pub people take it on or whatever but that's you know that's something that we can certainly put back to the applicant which i understand is uh, the middlesbrough development uh, company so it's the council's yeah. if you like arm's length development company um the main thing is we don't let it become a problem for neighbors and for the area as you say so um putting the curb line back in to stop vehicles driving onto it and fencing it off is the start of that and then having a scheme to deal with it whether it be take up the tarmac and grass it and then you know long term we'd have to see what ownership wise uh, the applicant wants to do with it thank you chair okay thanks, thanks andy right anybody else want to ask andy a question councillor coop thank you chair um yes i'm pleased to see that the um Cycle parking has been exceeded the uh, the recommendation by quite a few. Forty proposed. Um, not so many parking spaces, but not 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 be a bad idea. But we'll have to see. I think it's 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 something that I've mentioned before about having shopping centres in um, or local shopping in housing development. Uh, I think it's you're quite right. You mentioned earlier on before that there isn't any nearby. It'd be quite a walk or quite a drive um to about roman road shops or acclam etc so this as far as i can see to be a good thing there's not many objections to it so as long as all the criteria match i i honestly think it'd be a good scheme and i would wish to support it thank you chair thank you councillor anybody else any questions for andy councillor dodds not so much a question as a statement i'm showing my age now but i can remember when the original shops were built and the people, the local people, welcomed them because it was their local shopping area. Now, I think it, this scheme looks lovely and that the apartments look nice. And I do like the idea of the sunroof. Another thing I would like to say, there is a bus that stops right outside this building. So if you can get the bus into town, they can come back on the bus from town to home. It's an amusing their cars. 
And as I should have mentioned in the previous application, the bus stop would take them from the old St. David's school site to this area to do the shopping. I think it looks lovely. I think it looks very, and I think it'll be very welcome to the residents. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> anybody else got anything to say to Andy? <coughs> Can't see anybody. Right, we shall move on. We've got no applicant stroke agent this time. Uh, no objectors have, uh, have mentioned it. They wish to speak, but we do have a ward councillor. We have councillor Eric Palano, who represents Ackland Ward. Councillor Palano, would you like to see your piece, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I support the application wholeheartedly because it looks very nice on paper, as most of these uh, artist representations do. But uh, yes, it's good to see that the ISO has been removed and hopefully it'll be a nice facility for the elderly people who don't wish to go into town and do their shopping to do their shopping close by. Thank you, Councillor. Right, uh, Andy, if you would read out the recommendations in the committee report, please. Thank you, Chair. So the, the recommendations to approve subject to condition or conditions and just uh, as I mentioned condition 10 and 14 the slight amendment to what's in the report that to allow development to start before they have discharged those conditions essentially but with adequate controls that officers will place on those thank you chair right thank you very much okay so we will now go to committee and ask if anybody would like to submit um, a proposal anybody want to say anything? councillor Cope Yes, Chair, I wish to propose that we accept the uh, proposal uh, subject to the usual conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Dean, you wish to second that? Right, so we've got a proposal from Councillor Cope and Councillor Dean. Have we anything else? Okay, so we'll go back to the voting system again. So we're voting on the planning application. So if we're voting, if we're voting, and if it's for if you agree with the application, it's against if you disagree, and it's abstain if you can't decide. So we'll start the other way around this time. We'll go to John Hobson first, and I'm for it. Councillor Cope? For, Chair. Councillor Branson? For, Chair. Councillor Dodds? For. Councillor Garvey? Four, Chair. Councillor Nugent. Four. John. Councillor Platt. <coughs> Four, Chair. Councillor Rostron. Four, Chair. Councillor Sheila Dean. And Councillor Wilson. Four, Chair. Thank you very much. Chair, I can confirm that all ten members have voted to approve the application. Okay, so we'll now confirm that we have approved that application subject to conditions. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to item agenda six, which is the um, applications approved by the head of planning. And thankfully, there's only three pages of them this time. Anybody got any comments they wish to say on them? Anybody, something in your ward that you wish to bring up? No? I have I have a question, Andy. Yes, or would it be Paul? I think it would be Andy or Paul. Uh, page seventy-one, the second one down, is a change of use to a hot food takeaway in North Ormsby, and it's been refused. Could you tell me why it was refused? Um, off the top of my head, chair, I will struggle. I believe. Well, I've got a meeting with you on Monday, so if you right. start. Sorry for Monday, that'll do fine. Yeah, and what we'll do, Chair, given you've asked it within committee, I'll, I'll email around to all committee members That's as well. That's fine, yeah. Smashing, yeah. It's just hot food takeaways. It's been refused. It's not par for the course, really, is it? You know? I believe it was outside of the local centre, but I will... I'll That's OK. As long yeah. as we have a reason for it. Good. Good, right. So nobody else got any note quotes or thoughts on these applications? Right, we'll now go on to the uh, the highlight of the meeting, which is um, the local plan, an update by Paul Clark. Paul, over to um, you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate um, William, members, we've been here for a couple of hours already. So I'll, keep, yes. I'll keep this brief. Um, that last um, committee was asked for an update on the local plan. Um, what I have put together is a few slides to, to talk to, if that's okay. It won't take too long. Okay, yeah. I'll tend, right tend to rattle through these. Um, bear with me one moment. Okay. Uh, what I intend to do is, obviously, what I want to look at first is give you a bit of background of why, why the local plan is um, taking a bit longer than um, originally envisaged. Um, a couple of years ago, the impact of COVID-19, what we've done to date in the meantime, the timetable we have in place for progressing the local plan to, to adoption now, and what some of those implications of the delay mean for the planning committee in particular. Well, obviously, we can't really talk about anything at the moment without mentioning, mentioning COVID. When, when COVID came along, it had a massive impact upon the um, local plan timetable not least because obviously the way that we, we engaged with not just with the public, but also with businesses and other stakeholders in the process. This impacted quite significantly on the way that um, we gathered evidence, uh, particular things, government surveys, um, working with um, employers um, to understand what the economic impacts are, what the, econo what the economic needs of the town going forward are. Because as you probably appreciate, they, they had more important things to worry about than what the local plan was going to say and what the local plan was going to do. Equally, as we've seen as well, there's been some massive implications for town centres and retail. Um, so that they have impacts upon how we gather the evidence, how we engage with people in this, in this process. In the meantime as well, there have also been some changes in the national policy in terms of how housing numbers are calculated. All members will be aware um, the government published its reforms to the planning system last autumn. We're still waiting to hear what the outcomes of those are going to be. Um, the government did publish at the weekend um, a further consultation on changes to the national planning policy framework. Uh, that's looking at strength in design aspect. I think it's actually one of the welcome changes to the NPPF, so obviously we'll be looking at it in detail. But these have all had an impact upon the timetable, things we need to take on board. Um, pro, in terms of the progress in the local plan, um, the local plan is based upon a number of studies. I don't know if you can see that slide at all. I'm more than happy to email these around to members if you so wish to, to have them. There are, there's not many, to be perfectly honest. Um, th this table shows the evidence-based documents that we are gathering to support the local plan review, um, gives details of them and when they expect to be completed. The first of those is probably one of the key ones, the local housing needs assessment. What that does, that is used to identify what the need for the town is and what will involve, inform how many houses we look to allocate in the local plan and what the delivery rate over the um, in year period will be. We've received the final version of that. Um, I believe if it's not already on our website today, it will be going on next week at some point because it's a key part of our evidence base. Um, one of the other key housing uh, documents we produce is something called Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment. What this does, we assess the supply of the potential housing sites in the borough. Just because a site appears in the SLA, it doesn't mean so it's going to be allocated. It's something we have to do, we have to update on an annual basis. Uh, because I'm sure if we had to, um, if all those sites came forward, I'm sure Councillor Coop would have a bit of a heart failure because the majority of people would be around Stainton. Um, we're expecting to finalise that report this month. Again, that will be appearing on our website. The Retail and Town Centre Study. This was the first evidence-based we commissioned um, pre-COVID. Um, that we received the final report in December last year. Again, that's working its way onto our, onto our own website. Obviously, what we will probably need to do is probably revisit this at some time in the future because because it was undertaken pre-COVID, it, un it doesn't take into account a full assessment of how COVID is impacting upon our town centres, the changes it's going to make. To be honest, I don't think anybody knows at this moment in time how it's going to impact upon them long term, only that we know they're going to take a hit. Employment land review has taken a bit longer than we had hoped, again, because the, the difficulties engaging with the business sector um, for understandable reasons, but that will lead to an identification of what our employment requirements are going to be, how much land we need to identify for employment uses, what type of employment land we need. 
I think one of the most exciting pieces of um, evidence we're gathering is something called the Green and Blue Infrastructure Strategy, which sets out putting the environment at the heart of the local plan. It assesses the green and the blue infrastructure in the, in the borough. So it's the green bits, the blue bits, um, where there is where where there's sufficiencies and um, deficiencies, how we can use them to connect to each other, how we can use them to connect developments, um, how we can use them to help to um, deliver not just the economy, but also the health agenda as well. Um, we've just gone out to consult further co stakeholder consultation on that document, and we expect to have the final report of that back in March of, uh, of this year. Uh, the Gypsy and Travel Accommodation Assessment, this is an update um, of the needs of Gypsy and Traveller and Show People communities, looking at what their needs are going to be over the plan period. Again, we're expecting that report to be finalised this, this month. And the final study there, one which is, um, is going to be quite critical in the local plan, the um, transport study. This is an assessment of the, um, the transport infrastructure needs associated with the, the allocations, the proposals in the local plan. One of the difficulties with finalising that study before we, um, at this moment in time is we can't do that until we know what sites we are allocating in the local plan. So it needs to be done in tandem with the local plan. Uh, provided it's completed by the time we submit the local plan and gone out to publication draft, that's fine. Um, so there will be an ongoing need to prepare that alongside the local plan, but a draft should be available for when we consult the preferred options document. So where are, what have we done so far? So, um, well, we have been taking the local plan back to the working group. Um, they, Councillor Coop and um, Councillor Hobson um, represent the planning committee on, on the working group as chair and vice chair of planning committee. So um, they are representing from the interests of, of committee uh, on, the, on that group and the, the key concerns which, which you raise um, in considering applications. We've looked at what the overall strategy vision of the local plan should be. We've looked at the conservation policies the last um, working group before Christmas looked at the housing numbers and the how potential housing sites that we should be bringing forward. Um, it was agreed at that stage that the housing number we should be looking at is 400 dwellings per annum. Um, there were some minor changes to, to the housing sites compared to the um, previous publication draft which was, was withdrawn. Um, a couple of sites will be coming out, but again, we'll be looking at um, the urban living, how those urban help deliver our housing agenda that would be quite critical going forward what we're hoping to do is report the preferred options document to executive in april of this year part of the reasoning behind that is as members will be aware we're currently at consultation on the stainsby country park uh, master plan document and um, that runs from the monday just got to the first of march and we take on board whatever comments we get back from that consultation and feed them into the local plan so that um, what intention is, is that both that document and the local plan will be reported back to executive on April so that um, we've got, we've got a, a fuller picture of, of the implications of, of the master plan. Publication draft, the first of the formal stages will be October of this year with submission in January next year an adoption, hopefully, in June 2022. What that does mean, obviously, there are implications, there are delays in the process, because under the original plan, when we published the local plan back in 2018, we had hoped to have the local plan adopted by now. It calls into, into question, as members have already heard on um, numerous occasions, the status of the current local plan. Is it up to date? Is it still relevant? Local plans adopted um, November 2014, just over six years old now. Um, for me, the key, uh, we, are, we are required to review local plans every five years. That review doesn't have to be a whole new local plan. It could just be said, we've looked at it, it's still up to date, so we're not changing it. Um, but the key element in the local plan, to identify if it's still current or not, is the, the housing sites and numbers. Are we delivering that? Do we still have a five-year housing land supply? Do we still meet our housing delivery target? If the answer is yes, then the plan can be considered up to date. However, as I pointed out um, this afternoon, one of the key issues is the consistency of some of those policies with the um, National Planning Policy Framework. Where a policy in a local plan is not consistent with the MPPF, the MPPF will take priority. And I think that adds to confusion in terms of status of local plan, it causes frustration. Why do we produce a local plan 
and why they're relevant and so forth. So it is still a relevant consideration for, for members. It's still an important consideration. It's still a starting point um, when you're looking at uh, planning applications. But what members have to bear in mind, the situation does become complex because of the nature of the NPPF and the fact that it continue to change that. And obviously, we potentially have a new planning system coming in shortly as well. In the meantime, we do have two interim policies, I think, which uh, again, members will be aware of, uh, particularly the hot food takeaway policy, the conversions policy, where we saw subdivision of units into apartments, not um, only too small, not up to standard. Both policies are still there. Both policies are being implemented. Um, as far as I'm aware, the hot food takeaway policy hasn't been challenged on appeal yet. Um, probably a matter of time before it does happen. The conversions policy has been challenged on appeal. Um, we've won some, we've lost some. I think it's fair to say that the ones we tended to lose tend to be the first ones which um, probably refused what he came in. Um, but the, the, the local plan will enshrine them within uh, the local plan when it's adopted. But what we don't know yet is what um, position a um, inspector will take on those policies, whether they will um, accept them or, or not. So it's the most um, as, as worded. So we'll wait and see on that, but certainly there is weight attached to them. They won't get maximum weight until they're adopted in the local plan. Obviously, COVID as well. Um, we still assess what does that mean for the local plan? Um, there is, I suppose one way of looking at it by not um, having the local plan adopted at the moment, if we had adopted the local plan on the original time, time frame, it wouldn't be flex it probably wouldn't be flexible enough to deal with the um, impacts of COVID, and it could actually lead to lead to problems um, for us going forward. So what we need to ensure is that the local plan that we have going forward that we take um, take forward is able to be flexible to deal with the changes as a result of, um, of COVID. That chair is all I really wanted to say. I'm hoping that just gave you a flavour of um, the local plan and where we are on that. More than happy to answer any questions on any particular issues that um, members may have with regard to the local plan. Thank you, Paul. Anybody got something to ask? Uh, Councillor Rostron, you've got your finger up. It's not a question, Chair, it's a comment. If I could thank Paul for that, that's really useful. As you know, my concern has been about the decision that the planning inspector took on the hot food takeaway. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know the, the health reasons i think every member of the committee expressed concern on for health reasons on, on hot food takeaways but there's also the environmental impact because if you look around most of the litter that's around town it comes from takeaways where people yeah. just chuck things down yeah. and i noticed a recent scrutiny panel about rats um the the officer said that they can bait areas to to try and kill the rats but if somebody's chucked a piece of pizza down the, the rats are going to eat the pizza rather than the baited yeah. food so it, it does have an environmental impact as well as yeah. the health impact um what i would like to say paul is that if some consideration could be given to reviewing what we term as hot food takeaways yeah. because you know when i go up into linthorpe village there are <laughs> several retail outlets mm. what we would call bakeries mm. and they've actually got ovens on the premises mm. cooking yeah. food and i think they yeah. should be considered to be hot food takeaways oh, as well as the should. actual um, fast food ones yeah. absolutely well, anyway absolutely yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, andy and i have discussed this at length following last committee when obviously the hot food takeaway um, application was refused um I don't we can't change the definition of hot food takeaway that's beyond our control but what no, we can no we can look at the policy framework we have in place to see whether we can have something which deals with those situations mm. i can guarantee how successful we will be but i think what i'd like to think is we can look at the local plan as a whole and we can look at the environmental policies we can look at the houses. what i'd love to have the local plan which doesn't highlight health as a particular issue so highlight a policy on it it's enshrined throughout what we're doing so it's it's fundamental to the local plan it's um, so yes, there will be a hot food takeaway policy there. Ideally, you shouldn't be able to pick up a local plan, but there's the health policy. It's something which, through to the different local plan, you are going to achieve that healthy agenda. So I'm very keen on how we can do that, and I think we we, we will try to look at how we can enshrine that those issues you've raised into the policy framework. Uh, and there will be a further opportunity when we, obviously when we take the third options out of consultation. For you to, to feed back on those issues 
Um, likewise, I, I'm happy again, once the preferred option has been, been published, to have a session with the planning committee on that, if you so wish, so we can talk through those policies, yeah. those concerns, and we can look at how it works and take that back out. I don't think there's going to be enough time between now and the preferred options document to, to do that, but because I think the priority for us has got to get that plan to executive so we can get that out of consultation and get things moving again. Because we don't really want to be holding things back. We've seen it already at planning committee today in terms of local plan and housing and housing numbers. We want to correct, have a bit more certainty going forward and ensure we've got that local plan adopted as quickly as we can. Thank you. Councillor Branson, you wish to ask Paul something? Just a very quick question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Paul, I'd just like to get hold of the copy of the uh, retail and town centre study. Uh, can I get that off the council website? Is that where I get it from? It's, it's not there at the moment, Councillor Branson, but once it's there, we'll email you the link to make you aware it's there. It is quite a bulk of document, so we won't be able to email it out because the sheer size of it just makes it. I just think our email system will crash if we were if we were to do that. But certainly, what I can do, I'm more than happy to email a link to members of our our evidence base. Where so that's lovely. Thank you, Councillor Cope. Thank you, Chair. I just want to agree with Councillor Rostrum about the obesity main part of it. Um, national average for child obesity in England is 22 percent. I think Middlesbrough is 28 percent. So. You know, it's something that really needs to be taken into account. And, and I do understand the committee's frustration, my frustration, all frustration about, you know, bakery is not a fast food takeaway and, and uh, um, McDonald's or whatever, um, not picking anyone particular, is a restaurant because that is a national standards. But we should be able to take them into account in, in the whole, saying a restaurant, hot food takeaway. We, we should be able to find a, a clause to get it into, uh, into the same thing that that's not, something you want uh, to have too many in that area so i totally agree with councillor ostrom on that we've both been saying it for quite some time uh, and thanks for mentioning stainton yes please don't put all the development of stainton it will give me a nightmare thank you chair Try not to. anybody else want to ask paul anything councillor dodds fire away no i would just like to agree with um uh, Julia Austin and David Cook. We've mentioned this before on planning. Obesity is a problem in our town. And I know we keep being told it, it this doesn't affect the planning application, but I think it's time that somewhere, some place it's put in that we can decide which ones we want to pass and which ones we don't. We don't have too many hot food takeaways. And I think we're all in agreement on the, the same reasons. It's It's not healthy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Chair, if I could just say, as, as often we don't disagree with anything that members have raised, it's just we find it, it difficult at times, we find it quite challenging coming up with the framework, which we can which we can support on appeal. That's that's for us, that's what we want to do. It's not to stop members refusing these applications, it's actually to get us into a robust position where we can support members' decisions on, on these. So we, when we when we approve them, we don't do it like recommend approval on these, we don't do it lightly, we are fully aware what members considerations are but we obviously we have to abide by what the rules are out there and take an assessment on them well this is policy compliant or isn't policy compliant right thank you paul anybody else want to question paul on his council judge you coming back i've come back I, I appreciate what you're saying paul and i know that you understand the way we feel um it's just it would be nice if something could be done thank you Councillor rostrum could, could I ask that the slides are emailed out to the members of the committee? No? Okay. Thank right. you. Done. Anything else, anyone? Right, that's it. I've uh, come down to agenda item eight. Any other business? I have none. I hope nobody else has any. So I'll bring this meeting to a close. Thank you for your attendance. I'd like to thank Georgina, Chris, Dan, Emma and Simon, Paul and Andy for their input today. It's been most appreciated. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Bye, Rob. Chair. Thank you.